Thank you, members. It's now time for questions to the Minister for Education. I call on Mr. Framakhan to ask the first question. Come on, Elgar. I'll ask you. Uh, uh, could I ask the Minister of Education whether he is considering expanding the criteria for the uh, question of request number one? Question right in. Minister. Thank the member for his question. Uh, just looking down, I think the uh, the list today uh, that has been it might have been quicker if we'd done the educational Ardesh uh, with the, the party opposite. We could have sort of covered the, the, uh, all the topics. In answer to the question, the provision of devices and Wi-Fi for those pupils who uh, need them has been a priority. I've invested significantly in the provision of laptops and other IT equipment. However, as with any finite budgets, resources have to be targeted where there's greatest need. And so priority has been given to children currently in year groups 12, 14, seven and four in that order who are entitled to free school meals and either have special educational needs or newcomer children or looked after children or otherwise uh, vulnerable where devices are available there's no bar to young people from outside that uh, year groups and i've uh, i've identified and who are entitled to free school meals from applying for a device and the ea the education authority is working with schools uh, to manage that process mr mccann uh, well, further than that, the, the Minister would know that many families who are also in difficult circumstances fall just outside the qualifying criteria, and many of these have now had their employment and incomes impacted by the pandemic. Given the prospect of increasing levels of remote learning, does the Minister agree that the need for IT equipment is greater now than the initial scheme had anticipated? Well, I would indicate that, that we are continuing to roll out devices. Um, as of September, there's around about 5,500 devices have been rolled out. There's now, um, I think the latest figures we had, which were up to the 9th of October, it was 7,865. But look, uh, and additionally, I think there are uh, 8,000 Chromebooks were, were purchased, and uh, 6,760 of those have been built to date. And there was just under 4,000 to be delivered to schools. But the member does make an important point. And as such, I suppose we're working, first of all, with the EA to see whether, in terms of their capital resources, those will be fully utilised this year, and if there is any level of underspend, because of the practicalities, particularly coronavirus, can additional money then be diverted into devices? If that proves insufficient, um, I will be happy, and we will be, on that basis, working with DOF to see if there's identification of any other capital money that can be diverted into digital devices, because the member is right, it is important that we ensure as much as possible uh, that there is that level of provision. I think I should make it clear as well that what we found we, early on in the, um, the situation that we did um, sought indications from schools. Where we find the greatest problem is not specifically really with a household not having a digital device, but it is probably uh, most pertinent where it's a situation that there's maybe one device within a household with a number of people trying to, to share that. Obviously, allied to this as well, is a need as much as possible to retain that face-to-face -face learning to, to minimise that pressure as well. But I'm cognisant of the, the needs that are out there. Mr Jonathan Buckley. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, could he potentially elaborate how he and his department plan to cater for children in rural areas, particularly with greater concerns surrounding technology and indeed broadband access? Thank the member for that. Obviously, in terms of it was May that I announced the scheme to uh, to lend the digital devices to pupils. And that also included both uh, in terms of those devices that were within the system, uh, as there was, a, a, there was maybe initially a misunderstanding that devices in the system couldn't be easily adapted, they could be through C2K. Um, but in addition, that, uh, that scheme included procurement of additional devices. And also I think what is critical, particularly for some rural areas, remote broadband uh, connectivity solutions. So, in July, I announced that free Wi-Fi and mobility, uh, mobile connectivity would be provided to children and young people, including those in rural uh, settings who didn't have access to digital technology. My department did carry out a rural needs impact assessment in relation to access to broadband and digital devices. Obviously, with the level of broadband across the country, there is a level of barrier that is there, which, some of which will be entirely beyond uh, the control of the department. I've been working, though, in terms of that rural solutions uh, with the Education Authority in partnership with BT to provide a range of solutions to address connectivity problems for pupils, particularly in rural settings, uh, and 
giving that consideration to rurality. That includes uh, supporting the provision of an initial quantity of up to 2,500 uh, MiFi devices, which is mobile connectivity solution to support children who are not within a BT Wi-Fi hotspot, and also providing 8,300 uh, Wi-Fi vouchers for disadvantaged children uh, with, up, with up to eight months. Uh, it's good to see that technology, um, there seems to be restrictions in rural areas, but it doesn't seem to have uh, pervaded uh, the chamber. So there, there is providing 8,300 Wi-Fi vouchers for disadvantaged children with up to eight months internet access. The public sector shared uh, network project being delivered by BT, which is a contract awarded by the Department of Finance, we're obviously trying to work in a joined up fashion, is in the pilot phase. But once it's completely rolled out, uh, it will see almost all broadband connectivity increased in all schools. Can I remind uh, members in terms of the importance of devices being turned off and also uh, questions should be brief and answers shouldn't run over over two uh, minutes. I call Mr. Colin Gildernew. Gormay Agat, Cash Devra question number two. Okay. My department publishes information on school attendance on the department website on a weekly basis. This information provides the overall picture on school attendance, but doesn't specify uh, which absences are related to COVID. We have been working with the PHA and the Department of Health because the figures that would be directly held in terms of issues around uh, broadly speaking related absences are actually held by them, they're not held by the department. So we're working to ensure that this is actually produced on a, uh, a sensible, uh, informative basis. So we've been monitoring uh, management information internally to get an indication of the trend. Uh, and so it's difficult then to put definitive figures on absences. However, let me give the figures that we, we do have. The overall pupil attendance rate has fluctuated um, from between 91.6% and 95.95%. Uh, Indeed, the lowest uh, attendance in terms of school attendance was actually in the week commencing the 7th of September, where it fell to 91.6%. The latest figures for uh, week commencing the 5th of October is 93.7%. Uh, as a result, the data will indicate, uh, the data is captured, the people attendance will also indicate those who are self-isolating and learning remotely. So as I set out in the circular, a child will be marked absent if they are ill, or they do not engage with, with remote learning. If we can put that on a level of context, that, that a normal, uh, the figures previous prior to this year had only been recorded effectively on an annual basis, which has shown normally an attendance rate of about 94%. So it suggests that while there's been some level of impact of COVID, um, that that has been limited. Similarly, in relation to teachers, data from uh, the 6th of October suggests, which is the latest figures, 92% of teaching staff were on site in schools. And overall, this shows a level of high school attendance. I do have some other figures which may be drawn out in a supplementary. I appreciate it more or less the point of two minutes. Mr. Gilder, you. Uh, Gorham Ayagat, and can I ask, uh, and thank you for that answer, can I ask then what lessons have been learnt over the past eight weeks to improve support for schools with high absences to help keep schools functioning um, when, they, when they return from this extended break? But it is, it is on the basis that uh, there has been, through the executive, money that's been made available, particularly as regards substitute cover, um, that there has also been the executive as a whole in terms of, which can be both uh, preventative, but also then in terms of response. Um, the executive as a whole has allocated, I think, just under 26 million for the full um, financial year in terms of PPE equipment. And when we're talking about PPE equipment, we tend to think of um, sort of the, the issue around gloves and around physical equipment, but the principal uh, usage of that is around cleaning, around um, hygiene products uh, within that. So there is that, that level of uh, production. I think it's also important that we put this in scale. I appreciate I wasn't in a position to give uh, all the answer. In terms of the initial information we have from PHA, but it's important to think that they break this down. Cumulatively, and I, I um, advice people as community, there's been a total of um, 1,491 positive cases of individuals within schools. That is stretching though in total from the 24th of August to the 13th of October. Uh, and that represents uh, around about 0.4 of 1% of the school population that has tested positive. Um, and that within that, in most of the cases where there has been an incident within the school, it has been of a single individual testing positive. I think from that period, 
Uh, there's also been, I think, a total of 10 schools out of a little bit over 1,000 where there has been more than one incident within them. But I think there is more definitive information that PHA uh, is working on to be able to provide. And it's important, therefore, that we get uh, PHA and DOH to produce evidence in, in a, or information in a way which is quite usable and quite accurate uh, as we move forward. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Education Minister what contingency plan is in place for children unable to sit transfer tests due to a COVID-19 related absence? Well, I, I would be rarely accused of um, being bilingual, but there is very much a, a case of plus al chance, plus al même chose from the, the member. The more things change, they, the more they stay the same. In terms of the transfer tests, the transfer tests are set by um, independent organisations. To that extent, the arrangements are um, it is the onus is on them, and also on we will be in contact and have been in contact with the schools uh, which uh, use academic selection as, as their basis. It's important uh, that it is their development of alternatives if needed, and I think there will be ongoing discussions in relation to that. But uh, academic selection and transfer tests are ultimately the responsibility of AQE and PPTC. There is no requirement on a school, for instance, to use that, uh, and so consequently, we will make sure that whatever actions are put in place and want to monitor this to ensure that, that anything is done in a safe uh, fashion. Mr Morris Bradley. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I apologise for that noise intervention. Uh, only a Chelsea fan like me would know what it was. Anyway, uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, thinking about the absence among teachers, uh, how would schools replace teachers who are self-isolating? Well, I, I didn't realise the member was a Chelsea supporter, which in my case he asked me to double apologise to the, the, the House. Look, there has been a great deal of good work done in terms of remote learning, so uh, there is that, that, um, that provision um, as well. Um, but in terms of uh, schools replacing teachers, schools should be able to continue to, f uh, to fill positions in the normal manner. There is a Northern Ireland substitute teacher list, uh, and to help support that, many of the new pressures arising out of COVID, um, I outlined a significant package of funding to help support the safe reopening of schools. That included 17.5 million towards the costs of both substitute teachers and uh, other school expenditure. There has been which there's further work in terms of that. Subsequent to that, the executive has also, through its COVID funding, uh, released an additional 9.2 million, uh, which again will look at, at the distribution of that. The fund for substitute teacher cost is being centrally managed by the Education Authority. Uh, and Funding will be allocated to schools on a needs basis based upon verified cost. So it should mean within reason then that there is that provision of substitute teachers. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, uh, uh, I'm just wondering what, what is the total number of teachers? that have tested positive across schools in Northern Ireland, and how many teachers have went off uh, isolating since schools have reopened? Well, from that point of view, uh, as I said, those are figures which, in terms of the broader picture, are held by PHA and DOH, and we're working on them revealing those. The, the indication uh, we're talking about across the figures that I have at the moment are in relation to a combination of the 333,000 uh, students and 19,000 staff, and of that group of 352, I don't have a breakdown uh, between, uh, PHA would have the breakdown between uh, the positive cases that were teachers and the positive cases that would be staff. The total of 1491 is the overall school population out of that 352, but I hope that the PHA will be in a position fairly soon to be able to give more detailed figures. And I should say as well, I reiterate again, that is a cumulative figure over a period of six weeks, six or seven weeks rather than an individual breakdown for a particular week. Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for his answers so far. It's good to get a figure, and it was the first Minister that last week gave us that information. We've been asking for this information for a number of weeks, Minister, at committee. Could the Minister give us a commitment that he will produce something akin to the, the Department of Health's uh, dashboard to keep uh, parents, teachers and pupils aware of the weekly figures uh, throughout this crisis? Well, I certainly will try all that I can. The indication of post, the fact that the DOH are able to produce the dashboard is that they are really, uh, as regards anything COVID, are basically the central receptor of information. So we are dependent upon getting that in a format which can then be used um, by the department. Um, so to some extent that that lies, I, I have no problem with that as a general concept, but we are dependent upon getting those figures 
uh, directly from the uh, from DOH. The figures that we do have, which is monitored by the department directly, um, are in relation to the percentage of teachers that are within schools, and also then the pupil attendance. Those are, if you like, two separate elements of statistics. They're, they're monitored. Um, I think sort of on a slightly different basis in terms of time scale, but effectively can give you an answer in, in each individual week. I'd be happy to publish those as well. Question number three has been withdrawn. Before I move on to call uh, Ms Ennis, I just want to say I allowed four uh, supplementary questions in relation to that issue because obviously COVID is a, a significant issue. People shouldn't take that as precedent. There won't be four supplementary questions to every question. Uh, call Ms Sinead Ennis. Gurum, I get to question four. Thank you, Member, for her question. It's a matter for the Education Authority working with uh, the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools and other sectoral support bodies to bring forward proposals to meet the needs of uh, children and young people. Um, as the Member may be aware that in terms of meeting a particular level of demand, uh, that would, is an area planning consideration uh, which then becomes a development proposal which is published by, uh, by the Education Authority. As such, from a departmental point of view, our, the department's role, and very specifically my role, is then to give a verdict on a particular DP. So I, I can't really bring forward a DP. I can't comment on the DP until it's reached that final stage. Uh, legally, I think that would leave me in difficulties. There are currently, I have to say at the moment, no published DPs for the Irish medium provision uh, in the new area beyond what's provided at, at present. Gurmagat, and I take on board the, the Minister's answer to that question. Um, Newry and Mourne has the highest uh, percentage of Irish speakers in the whole of the North, yet the only Bunskull, Bunskull and Ure, um, in Newry City is wholly inadequate, um, is in dire need of major f uh, capital uh, investment. So, I mean, I, I just want to put that on the, on the Minister's radar and say, look, I, I would appreciate you visiting the school, speaking to the school community, the principal, the Board of Governors, um, and seeing how we can uh, collaboratively work together to, to improve the provision for Irish medium education in the Newry area. Well, look, I, I'd be very happy to take, and I think I've been at um, different schools in different sectors. I mean, a number of Irish medium schools. I know, um, uh, particularly, uh, your colleague Karen Mullen facilitated, I think, one day, particularly four visits to uh, a number of Irish medium schools up in the northwest. And I've been at a number uh, as well, including uh, the largest sort of post primary um, Irish medium school in Northern Ireland, uh, Costa Firsta, uh, roughly about a month or so ago. So I'd be more than happy to accept an invitation to see what's happening on the ground. Uh, I suppose one of the issues has been that in terms of looking at a longer term project will require development proposals. Um, as with a lot of things with COVID, there's been a level of delay within the DP process because both at EA level, sectoral support bodies and even the department, where resources have had, uh, not just financially, but in terms of human resources, have had to be shifted towards the, the COVID side. I'm glad to say that there is some movement now in terms of restarting development proposals. Uh, and obviously, particularly in terms of that, a sustainable uh, Irish medium provision in the Newry uh, in the Newry area. Uh, obviously, there's a critical role, I think, uh, to be played by CNG to be able to give their thoughts as well within that. But obviously, as regards individual proposals, I can't comment on those until they reach the point at which a development proposal is directly put forward for decision. Mr. Justin McNulty. Gurumayogatlashkankhola, and can I thank the minister for his answers thus far? Mullanaiga, I was Chucky She. The principal, the parents, the board of governors, the headmaster, they're passionate about that philosophy of educating our young people through the medium of our indigenous Gaelic language. Minister, you know why I've asked you a number of questions on this before in relation to the, the works ongoing and the, previously, previously about the school and the works towards the, their 105 enrolment, qualification for inclusion on the capital work scheme. Can the minister advise? if the department have agreed a site for any new build? And will he take the opportunity, when public health guidelines permit, to visit the school and see the incredibly positive work that's going on there? Well, obviously, in terms of this response, I'm giving the more general position as regards the, the new area. Uh, I'd be happy, as I said, to visit, visit any school. I can't come to the detail of a specific, uh, the specifics that the member has asked in relation to the school, but I'll be happy to write to the, minister, to the member, giving him details uh, in connection with the issue that he's, he's raised. Question number five has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Melissa McHugh. Gormagot, last con Carla. I have a share. Minister, uh, question six. Thank the member for his question. An updated version of the coronavirus um, COVID 19 guidance for schools 
and Education Settings in Northern Ireland was published on the 29th of September 2020. This guidance provides a framework for how schools and education settings can operate in an ongoing COVID-19 environment. And guidance will be reviewed on an ongoing basis because we are in a, a moving situation to ensure it remains in line with the wider health uh, position. Designated link officers from the Education Authority are working closely with school leaders to ensure that individual issues are resolved promptly and to identify what more can be done to provide uh, support. The EA is a dedicated COVID-19 helpline and there is an FAQ section on the EA website. To help support schools to address many of the new pressures arising out of, out of COVID-19, on the 24th of August, I outlined a significant package of funding to help support the safe reopening of schools, which was supported by the executive. This funding will help address some of the pressures um, arising as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in doing so, protect our children and young people and those working in education settings. Now, in terms of that, uh, there is also a mentioned uh, the Engage programme, which is helping those pupils uh, across the country who have missed out, particularly between March and April, where they have not had that direct bit. In terms of uh, that, within the council area, there has been 1.26 million of this financial package has, has gone to 79 schools. And the programme will enable primary and post-primary schools to provide additional teaching support for pupils, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds, and that will help pupils to engage with learning following lockdown by enabling schools to provide child centre one-to-one small group and team teacher support by qualified teachers. Michael, uh, uh, Minister, uh, can I ask you uh, what contingency have the Council for the Curriculum Assessment and Exams uh, proposed for the delivery of examinations next year, given the fact that many people's educational experience will be vastly different uh, due to the sheer level of disruption and an evenly distributed nature of that disruption. And surely we can't expect students to be examined in the usual way. Well, in one sense, uh, I suppose I would make three points in relation to that. I think it is important that, that if possible, examinations do go ahead. I think because they are the most equitable and fairest assessment of an individual's um, abilities within that, whereas any other mechanism is always going to be a certain level of second best. The member does make a point that, that can we expect everything in 2021 to be on exactly the same basis as it, as it was beforehand? And no, that is not the case, which is why that whenever the, um, I put forward the decision that we have made on um, examinations, there are a range of mitigations that have to be put in place. So I think there will be work, uh, for instance, in terms of the removal of an assessment unit. There is on specific courses. Uh, a range of units which have been removed largely through health and safety reasons. Uh, and also we have asked the CCA to explore optionality to try to ensure that um, that, that is one other device in which things can be made uh, on a more level playing field for pupils. It is also the case though with examinations that we need to ensure that examinations are comparable with other jurisdictions because pr principally at A level and to a lesser extent at GCSE, our students will be competing with students from different jurisdictions. So we've got to make sure uh, that we are on a similar pathway. I think part of that will be discussions across different jurisdictions on the level that we pitch the examinations, because I think simply to return to the level that they were pitched in 2019, I think would be something in terms of issues around grade boundaries, for instance, uh, that would be very difficult to sustain given the, the level of uh, disruption there has been. But finally, I would say as well, as part of that, the member mentions about contingency plans. One of the other areas that I've asked CCA is to bring forward a range of options as regards contingencies for 2021. That is probably less in terms of the fact of whether there will be exams or not, but it is likely, depending on how we uh, move forward, that there will be particular individuals who will, may not be able to sit an examination, and those are going to be catered for within the, the system. Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and again, thank you to the Minister. Minister, you have rightly mentioned the Engage programme, vital uh, intervention for schools. Can the Minister explain how two schools in the one town received the same sum of money, given that one school had 750 pupils and the other school had 250 pupils? One equates to £100 per head per child at the 250 children, and the other at £36 per child at the 250, even though the school with lesser pupils has a lesser amount of children on free school meals? Well, the position was that, that the system that was adopted, because we needed to ensure that there was 
Not simply could you have something that was relatively straightforward, because this is largely about purchasing in teacher resources. So we couldn't have a situation in which we had a thousand schools throughout Northern Ireland with differential rates of uh, amount of financial support. That wouldn't have made sense. It would also, from an administrative point of view, have been hard to put together in a relatively short space of time. So the position, I suppose, was that there was two particular criteria that was produced. There was a higher level of funding for those schools, and I think it's important that we give the greatest level of support where there's a the greatest level of social deprivation. And so there was a higher level of funding for schools that, that qualified as being uh, above the average level of free school meals. And then within that, there were, I think, off the top of my head, four separate bands of, of funding according to numbers. As I said, you could have disaggregated that to each individual pupil, but again, it's not necessarily about the individual application, it's about providing a level of support. There was also below that to ensure then uh, that there is some level of support that was out there for other schools. There was a smaller pot of money um, which has then been allocated, um, roughly speaking, equating to either 0 0.2, 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 uh, of a full-time equivalent of teacher within that. Now, whenever you have any system, whether it is on the basis of um, a school's level of funding, whether it is on the basis of uh, a social security type, type funding, where there's a level of banding, you're always going to get some level of anomalies. But it was important to think that we ensured that there was a distribution to money um, to schools. And that, don't forget, this is all additional money to, to schools. So I appreciate that some schools will have felt they've got a good deal, uh, others less so. But this is all additional support that's, that's being made available to schools. Uh, Mr O'Toole is not in his place. Mr Sean Lynch. Ever a hawk. Question eight. Just very much keeping the, the Sinn Féin bandwagon uh, rolling on in relation to that. Um, the member will, will be aware that schools closed for a two-week period uh, from today for an extended half-term break until uh, the second, Monday the 2nd of November. Um, and the proposal that was put through the executive was that schools will reopen on the 2nd of November. Now, everything within COVID is always under review. Uh, so. It is as we move ahead, there will be individual disruptions of schools. We've given guidance uh, within that. But it is important that the level of disruption is kept to a minimum. And that's why I believe it's important that we do see that resumption of face-to-face -face teaching on the 2nd of November and beyond to ensure that we give the best possible support to all our pupils. I'm going to break a sense. I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, we are subject to an ever-changing public health crisis which could require further closures if that's the medical and scientific advice. Does the Minister agree that these uncertain times that the, he should be preparing for the real possibility of further closures? Well, no, I'm not planning for failure. Uh, and on that basis, I think it is important that we do keep schools open. And it's noticeable that what has happened in other jurisdictions. Uh, you know, uh, I... Generally speaking, do not look nostalgically across the border to uh, the south, but they have obviously, for instance, prioritised schools to make sure that they are kept open. It is vital that our schools are kept open. It is vital that we ensure, uh, and that goes beyond, obviously, the principal focus is on support for children. It is also a key role that that plays for parents, for the economy, but also for the future. And we've got to have a situation where we don't damage the education of our young people, uh, and indeed, what has been indicated, which I'll be working with, um, with health and with the CMO, is that where there have been any issues around schools, it has not been within the schools themselves. It has been the, well, maybe we call it the, the more peripheral aspects. So I'll be talking later on to the infrastructure minister around any actions that could be taken around school transport. I think there's a clear message also out there for parents in terms of, I think, one of the issues has been um, issues around collection at the school gates. So we'll need to look at all of those. But I think actually the safest place for pupils, both academically and from a public health point of view, is within schools, where it is a strong, controlled environment where both education and health can be maintained. There's less than a minute remaining. So if Mrs Rosemary Barton keeps it short and sharp, and the Minister does as well, we'll get through it. Um, thank you, Minister, so far for your answers. Minister, what reassurance and guidance can you give to parents about children wearing masks on the school buses. I'm getting a lot of complaints about that. I understand that. And look, I'll be talking with the, um, because I'll be bringing forward a paper to the executive, I'll be talking to the infrastructure minister, um, I think 
Stuart, in about an hour's time in relation to that, that subject. I think the other thing which we do need, and this is where it needs to be a cross-departmental bit, it's not simply what happens directly on the buses, but I think one of the biggest areas of complaints, certainly that, that I have heard, is the congregation, if you like, of, of young people when they're waiting to get on buses and that side of things. I think the other thing we shouldn't forget is that whatever happens from a broad school environment, probably the biggest single problem will be a levels of socialisation that happens that are completely any distance away from schools. And that's part of a wider problem that we have within society about actually trying to control things rather than uh, the more controlled environment we have, be it within work or schools. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to topical questions, and I call Ms Martina Anderson. Good. Um, Minister, the Skag area of Derry has a high level of young people and a chronic shortage of community services. Uh, you have land, H1C land, and it's not big enough for schools. So, Minister, will you consider repurposing that land for youth facilities in the area? Well, look, I'll be happy to look into if there are specific problems in an area, and if the member wants to write with, with greater detail to me, I, I will get back to her. I, I'm conscious in terms of, I will certainly look at, at anything. Um, I will presumably have to be bound by what legally I can do um, on that basis as well. So I will take all those into consideration. But I want to ensure that we have the maximum amount of facilities for all our young people. Uh, Minister, I appreciate uh, that response. And during the week, um, myself and Karen Mullen, you know, she's a fantastic education spokesperson for Sinn Féin, and she facilitated a meeting with some of your officials in the department and the education authority as well, along with an organisation in the Skag area called GSAP, a community organisation. So one of the things we'd like you to consider when you're looking at that H1C land, if that you would involve yourself in helping us to develop a business case so that if you can take that forward, that you assist with the business case process. Again, uh, we will try and be as whatever assistance we can, again, within the limits of what we're allowed to do legally. I know, and I think it's probably within the wider context of youth settings, but this may well come up that I'm, I'm due to speak to your colleague uh, I think we have a Zoom call on, on Wednesday. So I don't know whether that will deal with the specific issues of that or whether this is more about wider youth provision on it, but certainly I'll be happy to look at anything. Mr Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you for answering so far. My question relates around um, some parties' fascination about closing schools and ultimately the detriment impact that has on kids and young people staying at home and family life, etc. etc. What support can you offer or give to those young people uh, you know, regarding their emotional health and well-being, etc. Well, look, it is important, I suppose, while uh, there has been a focus on, uh, and rightly so, on the, the academic impact that is there in terms of the issue of, of closure. There is no doubt that, that I think both during the spring and there is a danger at times when, when children are off. This will have a devastating effect on, on mental health as well, because if things are to be followed through the way they are supposed to, it will lead to certain levels of isolation uh, for young people. As such, I suppose there are two levels of support uh, that will be made available. Uh, there is a broader, um, which was something that was pre-COVID, uh, mental health and well-being um, framework that was being developed, uh, which I'll be bringing forward and has a level of funding, which would be on a, an annual ongoing basis. Um, but in terms of the immediacy, there's obviously a need to ensure then that, as well as the Engage programme dealing with a catch up, if you like, in terms of academic. There is, if you like, a level of uh, support that, that needs to be given on the mental health on a one-off basis in terms of the COVID situation. As such, the, the executive agreed, as part of the overall package of restart um, for schools, a £5 million um, funding package. We put proposals, I think, which are simply to get, I think, uh, final business case approval and would hope to move on that um, relatively soon, probably in, in early November. Uh, and again, part of this will be, as with the Engage programme, it will be actually making levels of support available to schools and schools actually being able to determine where they feel the best interventions will take place. Because I'm conscious of the fact as well that we don't do everything simply on a top-down basis because I think that would be, again, trying to sort of put uh, you know, square pegs in round holes as regards to that. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. You referred to November, Minister. Is that referring to the package is in place or is that referring to actually impact on the ground and we see the benefits of that money? So in other words, 
you know, the benefits in school? Well, I think the quickest way that, that money can be distributed um, would be then with a direct funding of schools that they would get a proportion of money. They would then be able to say, because, look, it is also the case that, that leaving anything else aside, because individual circumstances will vary, areas will vary. So, um, for example, somewhere in the middle of Belfast, uh, a school would uh, may take a different view from somewhere in a rural setting in, say, County Tyrone, for instance. Uh, and similarly, what levels of interventions you would make for a seven-year-old would be very different from what you make for a 17-year-old. So th there will be that level of flexibility that will be produced. As I said, additionally, we're looking, some of which will be pilot programming, that whenever we have the uh, mental health and wellbeing framework, which we will need executive sign-off on, but that will be something, I think, that will be mainstreamed into the future uh, in terms of that, that level of support. Mr Sean Lynch. Good morning, uh, I'll ask Anne Collier. Minister, many school leaders and students have been left uh, disappointed and frustrated after the proposals that have been recently announced by SEA. Um, only a week after you announce these proposals, schools will have an extended mid-term break uh, due to COVID. Does the Minister accept that these proposals need to be reconsidered to take into account the likelihood of further disruption to the school system this year? Well, no, I, mean, look, I think there will be a slight degree of adjustment in terms of there are exams that were planned for November where there will be a slight degree of, of delay within those uh, in terms of the autumn series. Look, I, again, as I said earlier, to have a situation in which examinations take place is the best possible solution, albeit with a range of mitigations that have been put in place. And we're not at the final point of those, those mitigations. It's also appropriate that there are um, a, a situation where um, contingency individual plans are worked out. But I would say, look, there's a lot of advantages at times of devolution in terms of different individual things that we can do. But I suspect of almost anything, the one thing that we can't as a society, because where we see ourselves um, often with a level of justification as being a place apart and being a special place, we can't afford when it comes to examinations and qualifications to entirely go on a solo run and risk a situation where either what we're putting in place for our young people is on a more difficult position than anywhere else, which would disadvantage our pupils, or indeed put something in place which simply is not regarded by, for example, universities or employers as being robust compared to other jurisdictions. So we've got to make sure that across a range of jurisdictions locally uh, that there is a level of comparability and portability of those qualifications. Otherwise, um, you, we may result in producing very nice results for one year, but those in, in the long run, those pupils will be disadvantaged. So it's, it's got to be about that level of compatibility as well. I want to thank the Minister for his answer, and he did mention the contingency plans, but Minister, we have been aware that the decision in March to close schools would have consequences for this year's uh, academic um, work. Here we are uh, near the end of October without comprehensive contingency plans or scenario planning. Can the Minister advise when will these planning be put, be complete? I hope the base can be as, as soon as possible, but it is important also that we get this right. And so SIA produced initial proposals, those went out to consultation. There was then beyond that a level of uh, discussion that took place between the department and SIA, but also involving using trade union side, using stakeholders, so that, for example, the, the, the reference group of school principals this was discussed with. But also from that point of view that um, there was then a level of discussion with uh, other jurisdictions as well to make sure that, that anything that was going to get done was not so out of kilter with uh, other countries that it would leave our students disadvantaged. That has meant that in terms of announcements on that, I think, uh, if I'm getting my time frame right, I think it was about a week and a half ago that there was an announcement made on the overall position. As part of that, we have instructed SEA to look at um, getting a range of options there for continuity. I think that is important, but it is also important, uh, and to some extent we are in a position that, that uh, come the spring uh, of this year, that decisions had to be made very quickly. It may be argued that in some of those things that, that uh, therefore not everything was got right and were moved too quickly. I think we've got to make sure that, that where we have contingency plans, they're going to be robust in all circumstances, they're thought through, but I would hope those could be produced as soon as possible. Mr. Mark Durkin.
Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Would the Minister or can the Minister explain the system used by EA currently to compute the distance between homes and schools for the assessment of entitlement for free home to school transport? I don't know, without getting into the technicalities of this, uh, there is something that is done uniformly because this has also been something I know that has been. Uh, and again, I'll be happy to write to the, minister, to the member with the detail of this. But I know that the position is one that has been done, tried to be done uniformly, because there has been, down the years, a number of challenges. I've, I've seen, I've been involved, uh, just at a, a local level. I've seen this happen with a number of, of schools where there was a divergence of how this was calculated. And so, you know, whether it's a, a uh, the nearest, if you like, um, physical route, whether it's by way of the, the crow flying. Uh, and as such, I think where there has been then things wrongly applied, there has then been a situation where uh, that has led then to successful appeals have been put in place in connection uh, with that. So I think there's a uniform system that is, is produced. The details of how that's precisely calculated, uh, I'll get to the, the member. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. W would the Minister accept, though, that a uniform approach doesn't take into consideration the unique characteristics of different uh, ge geographical areas, the, the difficulty of some routes, the safety of some routes, and therefore isn't the ideal way to approach this? But I think the problem with that, look, I, I, I understand the argument that's being used in relation to that, but I think if there are a range of situations where this is almost judged by a case-by-case -case basis, I think both from an administrative point of view and also a level of fairness point of view, um, then I think it becomes entirely inequitable and you get a situation where you're trying to make judgment about, for example, to what extent if, if a pupil uh, was having to uh, walk to school, to what extent what are there pavements, what, uh, what level of support you give in connection with that, what's the level of rurality, uh, what's the busyness of the roads that they're having to cross to get there. So I think all those factors would make it incredibly difficult to find a fair system and where somebody could be argued to have missed out who should have got and vice versa. I think having, and this is, let us remember, a situation where this is universal um, free level of, of, of transport. And we have in the region about 80,000 pupils each year get that, that, that free, uh, free bus pass. So it is one of the more generous systems that, that operate. I, I just think it would be impractical if we were to try to take every individual factor into account uh, where a child um, would be trying to get to school. I think we've also got to recognise that, that nowadays, for the vast majority of, of children, it will actually be parents taking them uh, quite often to school the days. Certainly in, in my day, whenever I was at, at primary school, um, I don't want to venture just how old the, the member opposite uh, is there, that the days of large numbers of children using that act of travel, simply of walking to and from school, will have reduced greatly since, since those days. And I think all this is going to be taken into account. Uh, on where we are. There will always be reviews of what is the, the right way to do things within school transport, but I think ha tailoring a decision according to the individual, I, I think, will inevitably create disparities and inequities between individuals. I have two minutes, so um, Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I wanted to ask the uh, Education Minister, given the PHA statement around flu vaccination and uh, delays of uh, flu vaccine. Um, does he foresee any difficulties in um, the rollout of the programmes within the schools? Uh, he, the, the statement actually came out while we've been in the chamber, so he may not be fully aware of it. And the PHA are stating that, um, that children uh, are unaffected because it's not the, it's not the adult dose, it's just a child dose. But um, does the Minister have any comment around that uh, vaccination for school children? Look, we'll be happy to, um, to work with, with PHA um, on the issue. Previously, I think prior to the decision taken in terms of the period of extending the half-term holidays, there had been intention to actually put a large number of children through this, this week. That, I think, would have been fairly impractical given the fact that the schools are closed. Uh, the best way, I think, of doing it with children is organising it probably on a class-by-class -class basis so that you can ensure the bubble that was there. But even within that, I think we had worked uh, with PHA to look and see whether there's alternative arrangements could have been done over the next couple of weeks in terms of, um, for example, maybe uh, almost like a drive-by situation. I th suspect from what the member has said, uh, and indeed from that point of view, I think there was a common position that had largely been reached with PHA. 
From what I think the member has said, it appears that that has been largely overtaken by um, events and that we will see an overall delay. I, I assume PHA will be able to factor in uh, ensuring that children do get that, that flu vaccination. Uh, the department will continue to work with them uh, on that to ensure that, that that is the case. But I think it's a lot easier to do that in a school environment when schools are actually fully functioning. And I think that at least could mean there is an alignment between the time the vaccine is, is taking place and schools being fully operational. That concludes questions to the Minister for Education. The next item on the agenda is questions to the Minister for Finance. If I could ask members just to take their ease.